Welcome to a presentation today on individual justice planning for persons with disabilities in North Dakota. Through our training today, we will go through the steps of writing an individual justice plan and ensure that you have the tools to write an IJP. We'll offer several tips and suggestions of how to effectively develop the assessment and write a plan. To start with, it's important to understand what is an IJP and who can it be used for. An IJP is a collaborative plan that is developed and monitored by a team of individuals. The client with the disability is at the center of the team and the team can also include professionals and other important people in the person's life. An IJP process is started by identifying and assessing the root of the behavior that either caused or may cause involvement in the criminal or juvenile justice system. The team then creates recommendations that are least restrictive, most effective, and will identify outcomes and a review process for the IJP. An IJP document, as all other records, are confidential, and the IJP process is voluntary, meaning that the individual with a disability and or their legal decision maker, if one exists, must consent to all components of the IJP. The creation of an individual justice plan is an opportunity to establish and build supports for youth and adults with a disability and to prevent involvement or address further involvement in the justice system. An IJP creates an alternative for the justice system and establishes resources to utilize to support the disability related needs of the person. The IJP also provides a framework for cooperation between agencies in the justice system. One of the key concepts when writing an IJP and understanding disability issues is a recognition that there may be behavior that is what is considered a manifestation of a person's disability. You might hear this phrase when working with the disability service delivery system, and it oftentimes is used when there is a behavior that is caused by or has a direct and substantial relationship to a person's disability. At times, this is considered criminal and can be and most likely is a cause or a direct relation to the person's disability if we're considering IJP use. One example of this is that people with disabilities often have unexpected reactions to situations which may be either an underreaction or perhaps an overreaction because of their disability. Understanding how the disability may affect a person's behavior supports and aids the team in determining whether that behavior is truly criminal in nature. When we talk about the eligibility process for an IJP, there are a couple key components to keep in mind. When we talk about criminal competency, there is a presumption that the person is competent unless the court has found otherwise. An IJP can be developed for both youth and adults who have either at risk behavior or are involved in the criminal or juvenile justice system. The person's disability must be tied to the behavior that is presenting as criminal and may also involve a child in need of services, which formerly would have been identified as an unruly child. These are concepts that oftentimes will be infused into the IJP process. IJP eligibility is often based upon the fact that there is a mental or cognitive impairment that is impacting the person. Examples of these are a developmental disability, a brain injury, a neurodevelopmental disorder that affects brain function, a significant mental illness, or other diagnosis that creates a mental or cognitive impairment. The diagnosis or the impairment determination must be made by a qualified professional who has the expertise to be able to provide that diagnosis. Some examples of potential diagnoses that create IJP eligibility are anxiety, 
autism spectrum disorder diagnoses, bipolar disorder, borderline personality disorder, fetal alcohol spectrum disorders, an intellectual disability, schizophrenia, and a traumatic brain injury. An effective IJP team will include team members that provide a wraparound support model for a person with a disability. Team members could include case management or program management, service provider staff, parents, family members, and other natural supports, a guardian if one exists, a supported decision maker supporter, school personnel, parole and probation staff, and if necessary for a youth, a legal custodian. When writing an IJP, there are various stages throughout the process that are important to understand, and we will try to go through these today to make sure that you have an understanding of the concept and know how to create them in order to establish a comprehensive IJP. These include understanding the presenting problem, conducting an assessment, identifying and building recommendations, establishment of an anticipated outcome, identifying how it can be integrated with other support plans or treatment plans, a process for review, and ensuring that consent is obtained by both the individual and or legal decision makers if they are involved. And again, a review of the confidentiality of these private records for a person. The first step in writing an IJP is to really clearly define what the presenting problem is and the specific behaviors that brought the person with a disability into the justice system or create the at-risk behaviors for involvement in the justice system. In this section of the IJP, you describe the behavior and include information regarding frequency, severity, history, if that exists, and the likelihood of the occurrence of this behavior for the person. The next component of writing an IJP is to conduct a comprehensive assessment. The purpose of the assessment is to ensure that all team members have a clear understanding of all of the different aspects of a person's life. The assessment is broken into categories or sections to ensure review and information gathering regarding all different components of a person's life. These include residential, vocational, education and training, medical, mental or behavioral health, financial, social and recreational, family, identity and cultural background, transportation, and advocacy or self-advocacy. There are also additional considerations to take into account when writing an IJP. A person may have skills or deficits that contribute to the problem, such as communication, coping skills, social emotional, and boundaries. There may also be environmental factors that need to be considered and healthcare conditions or medical conditions that impact the person's life. There may also be life changes that could lessen or eliminate the problem, and there may be areas of strength that need to be built on in order to address the skills or the deficits that are currently present. This is an example of an IJP worksheet in order to conduct the assessment that we've talked about. You'll see each of the headings includes probing questions or things to get the team thinking about how to gather the necessary information. By answering the questions, you will be able to develop information that is helpful to take into account when writing the IJP. All of the documents that we will be showing you today are available on PNA's website at www.ndpanda.org. All of the forms are fillable and available for your use just to plug information in and build the assessment and the IJP. Once you have conducted the assessment and identified areas of strength and areas of need for a person, 
The IJP team will then develop recommendations. Some potential areas to consider are positive behavioral supports, counseling, supervision and or case management, community service, hospitalization, agency transfer, treatment or training, medication management or the involvement of a psychiatrist to look at psychotropic medication, restitution, fines, restorative justice, probation, or incarceration. One of the things to take into consideration when identifying recommendations is the specific skills of the person. For example, you would not want to take a look at establishing a fine if the only income for the person is Social Security income and they have a representative payee. In that situation, the person most likely does not understand the concepts of money and would not have the ability to recognize that paying a fine is actually creating a consequence or a response to the fact that they engaged in criminal behavior. In that type of situation, it's important for the team to take a look at, instead of that fine, what will help identify the process so that the person does not continue to engage in the at-risk behavior. Another example is if we're looking at community service. It is something that oftentimes an individual with a disability, depending on their needs, may have staff that would need to accompany them in order to complete that community service. So there's considerations to take a look at when you're supporting a person and identifying that as a viable recommendation. It's also really important in the process of developing recommendations to identify what support is needed in order for that recommendation to be carried out, because that is something that you'll want to build into the IJP process. This is an additional worksheet that has been developed to help the team walk through a series of questions in order to develop comprehensive recommendations. Again, this is a form on PNA's website that is built so that it's fillable and can help the IJP team walk through the process of developing recommendations in the various areas. If there's a section that isn't applicable or does not apply, it can be deleted and just excluded from the document. There are a few things to keep in mind when building recommendations as part of the IJP process. It's important to ensure that the resources and the services are available to ensure success. There's a need to integrate the juvenile justice or criminal justice system and community-based services so that they can blend together to provide the necessary support. There's a need to ensure that there's the least restrictive and most effective recommendation in order to elicit the outcome that's needed and identify responsible parties and or a service provider that is going to help implement that recommendation. The next step in the process is to identify other recommendations. This may be unique to the person and could include involvement of parole and probation, a process of ensuring that monitoring or a check-in process is part of the IJP, and may also be additional steps or supports that the person should engage in to ensure long-term success. The team will also look at developing an anticipated outcome to ensure that everybody understands what the outcome will be and hopefully the necessary steps taken to ensure that there is not future involvement in the juvenile justice or criminal justice system. If a person has an existing plan, such as a treatment plan, IEP, outcome support plan, it's important for the team to identify whether or not the IJP will be integrated into an existing plan or whether or not it will be a standalone plan or perhaps an addendum to a current plan. Regardless, it will be important to ensure that there's consistency between the IJP and other treatment or program plans 
and that the information does not in any way conflict with one another. The IJP should also determine a process and a timeline for periodic review and also identify a person who will be responsible to ensure that that review and update process is done regularly. When implementing an IJP, it is important to remember that it is a living document. It should be reviewed at regular intervals. It may be modified whenever needed. And the only exception to this is if it's part of a court order. Compliance with an IJP is voluntary unless it's court ordered and also should include a person that is identified to be the reviewer and monitor of the IJP and its implementation. In the previous slide, we talked about the IJP process being voluntary. As a result, there is a need to ensure that there is consent provided by the person with a disability and if one is in place, a legal decision maker. This could be a county custodian for youth. It could also be a court appointed limited or full guardian. It's important to also recognize that a person may have a supported decision-making agreement and that there may be a supporter that it's important to include. Once developed, it's important that the person and others involved are fully informed and are aware of the content of the IJP. It's important to show proof and acknowledge that the consent has been provided for the implementation of the IJP on the document itself. Consistent with all records regarding a person with a disability and their services, the IJP is a confidential document. It can be shared with others if proper authorization has been provided, and that should be in written form. PNA does have a sample authorization to disclose information that can be utilized on our website, which again is www. PNA has created a variety of resources regarding the IJP process. PNA's website does have a comprehensive IJP manual that contains several chapters that can help understand the IJP process and how to write an IJP. There are also several appendices that have helpful information to include the history of the IJP process, terms and definitions, worksheets and fillable forms, examples and scenarios to help you understand what a completed IJP looks like, information regarding disability awareness, and flowcharts regarding the adult and juvenile justice systems. Chapter six in the IJP manual also discusses the adult and juvenile justice systems along with information regarding the Americans with Disabilities Act to hopefully provide some foundational information that is helpful to you. PNA's website also has other resources to ensure that you've got knowledge and information to help understand the IJP process. One of the things that we have found in doing IJP work over the years is the necessity for people who may have limited communication skills to provide information to law enforcement should they find themselves in a situation where they're being questioned or involved with law enforcement. The disability awareness card that is attached is something that can be completed and given to law enforcement should there be an opportunity in which there's a need to communicate. Oftentimes by bringing people in that can help communicate and support a person will ensure that law enforcement has accurate information and knows how to approach and interact with a person. This slide just provides some additional resource information, including the IJP manual, information regarding competency, surveys of prison inmates, information about connections between brain injuries and crime, additional information regarding fetal alcohol syndrome, and disability awareness. As noted previously, all of the information regarding individual justice planning 
can be found on PNA's website at www.ndpanda.org. You may also call and talk with our centralized intake staff at 701-328-2950. If you would like to stop into our state office, we can be found at 400 East Broadway, Suite 409 in Bismarck, and we also have nine additional offices across the state. That information can be found on PNA's website also. Again, thank you for your time today, and we look forward to contact with you regarding individual justice planning.